Nadine Crocker is a director, writer, actress, and producer. Her debut feature, Continue, will be released in 2022, which Crocker wrote, directed, and produced alongside Cassian Elways. Continue is based on Crocker's life and true story of surviving a suicide attempt when she was 23. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Nadine Crocker. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Aideen, um, I always like to say that this this show is about kind of uncorking the stories behind the stories, and we primarily feature storytellers uh, on uncorking a story. And I'm curious, where where does your story begin? Oh my goodness! Uh, I guess my story begins when I was 16, and I left school and everything I know, and I moved to Los Angeles on my own and fully supported myself from 16 years old uh, with a billion jobs in LA trying to pursue my dreams. And, um, you know, it's kind of where my, my story really started to develop and being here when I was 16 on my own and, you know, finally starting to, you know, grow and grow into my own and go through a lot of those years alone and, um, you know, started to experience and battle, which I had already kind of knew was going to be part of my journey. Uh, but, started to battle depression and anxiety and different things in my life. And, you know, also being in an industry that is coupled with a lot of rejection and um, not always the most healthy relationships. Uh, You know, it's, it was very, it, it was an interesting path. I can, I can say, and it led me to a lot of my struggles and the uh, you know, the many attempts if I'm honest, on my life when I was in my 20s and especially around 23 years old, um, you know, going through a lot of trauma and and pain and family stuff by myself in the city, you know, and not having the resources or the knowledge how to get through it all. So I mean, just going back to when you were 16 and deciding deciding to leave home to, to LA, sort of what what, where, where were you? I mean, geographically, like, where were you raised? What was going on when you were, when you were 16 to, to make you say, you know what, I'm going to leave everything behind and, and head to California. So I'm from Fra- Fresno, California. So it was like a four hour move, <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, I had always known that I was really into the arts. Um, my father was a country singer. Uh, I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, but I grew up my main years in, uh, Fresno, California. And, um, my dad was a very, is a very talented singer songwriter. Um, and you know, he was doing big things and I think would have had a really beautiful career. Um, and my grandfather took his life and it changed our entire life. You know, my dad gave up on all of his dreams and we ended up moving, um, back to Sacramento. And then eventually a couple of years later to Fresno, which is where I did most of my growing. And, um, you know, I remember as a kid watching his music videos and being like, I want to be that girl. I want to be the girl in the video that has this beautiful love story. And like, you know, I just, I, uh, I always thought that I wanted to be her. And now I'm realizing the movies I'd invent in my mind from those songs and the music videos I saw myself in and doing, I'm actually, I was actually directing and writing like, and I don't think I actually wanted to be in the videos. I was actually designing my own videos. And, you know, so I knew very young, I was going to have a creative life. And um, that was my main interest. And, you know, from, oh man, what, what age was I? Sixth grade, seventh grade, I got my first modeling agency and I started commuting. And then I, you know, started, I found reps in Los Angeles and started commuting back and forth. And, uh, you know, I, I, school wasn't a great place for me. I never really felt like I belonged. I was pretty heavily bullied and, um, and, uh, I just didn't feel like there was anything left there for me. And I think my parents were worried that I wouldn't make it with my, you know, really bad depression and loneliness and, uh, you know, anxiety and all of the things. And so when I came to them and auditions were going really well and, you know, reps wanted to sign me and everyone wanted me to come out there. And so I, you know, went to them and was like, I, I'm so miserable here. And that is one of the only things that make me happy. Like I have to go, I have to do this. And they were like, we agree, go, you know, and they supported me and I'm so grateful. I think about that all the time as a parent. Now I'm like, dude, I'd never let him. I'd be like, no, you're not leaving me. You're not doing that. And I'm like, how did my parents 
do it, you know, but they knew, like they knew I had to, it, it was the only thing that was going to make me happy, you know? Yeah. You know, I talked to a lot of authors and, um, you know, when, when, you know, I always ask them to talk about sort of what prompted them to, to start writing th- and to think that they could make a career out of it. A lot of people say, many of them tell me, uh, you know, I had this teacher or I had somebody in my life who supported me, who, who just told me they thought I had something and they were behind me and that gave me the confidence to do it. And, and I think having the support of, of people, especially your parents, um, and I, I could see, I mean, you know, as a parent myself of three 19 year olds, um, if one of them came to me and said, Hey dad, um, gonna leave school, uh, gonna head out to LA. Um, I would have a hard time with that. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest and say, you know, I, you know, <laughs> the 18 year old Mike who wanted to head off to, you know, become a, a rock star, <laughs> you know, that person died a long time ago. <laughs> like he so he didn't, didn't die. He's, he's sort of buried somewhere inside me waiting to come out again for an act two, but um, that's, that's another story. Um, <laughs> But I mean, having that support is, has got to be um, has got to be just a, a tremendous thing to, to help you, you know, kind of push through those those times when you're when you're going on auditions and, and the news, you know, sometimes oftentimes probably isn't what you want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, those close people, I always say that it's like the, the closest people to you. It's like you have to be really careful about the people that are closest to you because they do affect you. And if they're a good influence, they can change everything. They can give you the strength you need to get through and not give up. You know, if you have bad people around you, it can do the complete opposite, you know? So I've always been really, well, not always, I've definitely learned a lot, but I've, I've tried to be really careful who I let around me because we already endure so much hardship and so much rejection in this industry and, and as a creative. And, you know, so I tried to really listen to the people who supported me that were around me. And yeah, I'm so lucky that my parents, you know, parents did, but as it is with all people is life gets busy and, you know, being down here and alone was, was really hard. And, you know, I'm just, yeah, I'm grateful. I'm grateful every day that I had them to be able to call to be call on. And because on those days where like, you're like, F man, that's the fifth job in a row that like I was on hold for it's me. And then it's not me. And like, you just want, you're like, I give up. I'm done. Like I am working in a bar till three in the morning, memorizing my lines. When I get home, going to three auditions the next day, barely have enough money to get the gas in my damn car. Like, what am I doing? You know? And then you call those people that are around you and they're like, this is what you're, you know, you're supposed to do. This is what you, you're like, okay, okay. You're right. You're right. Okay. I could do this. I can get there one more day, you know? So I, I do, I feel so damn lucky that they were crazy enough to let me do this and to support me once I was, you know, was out here. As, as you, as you talk and share that story, I'm I'm hearing the song baby girl by sugar land in my head. Do you know, do you know that song? Um, I, I know that I do, but you'd have to, you'd have but, to sing it to me. <laughs> you know, I, will, I will not sing it because then I'll lose all of my audience. Um, but you know, it's about this, you know, from the point of view of a, of a country singer, um, and, and the sort of the chorus goes, dear mom and dad, please send money. I'm so broke, but it ain't funny. Um, or that it ain't funny. And it's just kind of about her path to, to sort of making it, um, in, in the music world. Um, and, uh, I mean, I don't know how much time you did spend in Nashville, but I know that's a very common, um, it's kind of a very common theme in, in country music anyway. Uh, so when did you, when did you first get a taste of, of success? You know, do you remember what the first role you landed was? (laughs) Um, yeah, my first, my first like real acting job was Hannah Montana. It was like, yeah, it was like two lines or one line, it was like a small co-starring part, but um, it meant everything to me. Also, Miley Cyrus was the nicest human and for no reason, like just put like took me under her wing that day and just was so kind. And that stuck with me forever because she didn't, you know, I'm sure there's a billion people that come through there and a million people who have one and two lines. And she was just so kind, not really like stuck out, stuck out in my brain. So yeah, that was one of my first experiences. Just hearing the name of that show brings back so many memories of watching it with my kids. I mean, that was, that was just kind of on a loop when my kids were young, you know? Oh God, I love that. Uh, So. Well, then you probably saw me in my big moment with um, 
back off helmet hair or something like that. It was, it was a silly line and I was a girl in the mall, but um, yeah, hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And so then tell me, so, so from there, um, just kind of walk through like big, big kind of career milestones, like kind of leading up to continue for me. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of, you know, tiny projects. I think that the ones that, you know, started to make me really excited and feel like I was finally on my path would be, um, like Cabin Fever. I was the lead in the, uh, 2017 uh remake uh which was a really huge moment for me because I saw that movie when I was a kid and it messed me up when the girl shaved her leg and the skin came off and like just having that moment where I'm like oh my god I'm the girl who's shaving her leg with the skin coming off like it was that was a really big moment for me I just remember being like holy shit dreams do come true you know and like just having those moments um and I think that, you know, Supergirl and Castle and just like other little episodes along the way that just were such special opportunities and and also just those moments where I'm actually getting to like live my dreams on the process. And, you know, it was it was it was a beautiful ride and I've got to work on some really amazing things, but, um, you know, never the stuff that I really wanted to like I wanted to show what I had inside. I wanted to make people feel things. I wanted to tell stories about people struggling because I had known a lot of struggle, you know, and I have endured a lot of trauma in my life. And I've been through a lot of stuff in my 33 years of life, um, you know, and, and from a young age on. So it's just been, those were the stories I knew I wanted to tell. And that's pretty much how, continue came about. Um, you know, I had struggled many years with depression and anxiety and all of those things. I have suicide that runs in my family. Um, everyone in my family, pretty much depression runs deep. I'm native American and Irish. So, you know, depression and uh, alcoholism and, and pretty much anything else you want to add to it. Yeah. yeah. The smile on your face is exactly how I feel every time I say that out loud. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I knew it would, I'd have struggles. <laughs> from a young age. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, like, when did you first feel it? Like, did you? I mean, I mean, you mentioned that you know your your grandfather, um, you know, took his life. Um, when did you first feel like you know maybe that you, you that you were wired differently from other people you knew? I think my teens. I think my teens is when I really started to discover it. Um, I also, you know, it's funny. I just said this to someone, and I it actually made me realize that was when I really first noticed my depression was I did Accutane, and it's a medication that can cause really suicidal, really bad depression, all of those things. And I, and it, and it did start to cause some of that in me and, or make me notice it because I think I had, you know, I've already, I had already had battles, um, with feeling alone, with feeling, um, yeah, I was feeling really alone. And like, I had nowhere that where I belonged, you know, I was to this for that. And I was to this for them. And, you know, I just never really knew where I belonged or had a place to belong. And I think that's probably why I left at a young age and was like, okay, I don't belong anywhere. So I'm just going to figure out where I belong and I'm going to keep fucking searching until I do, you know? And, um, but I think it was, yeah, definitely in my teens. I think after I tried Accutane is when I really noticed it. And then it kind of stuck with me ever since. So it's hard to remember exactly what age that was, but I'm going to guess it was around 16 or 17 too, because it was when I came out to LA and was like, you know, very conscious at that point, I had reps that were like very much on me about appearance and weight and just, you know, they're always, you're always, you're not this enough. You're not that enough. And, um, you know, so I, I had to fix my acne and it didn't really matter if it was going to make me depressed or suicidal or any of those things. And, you know, it just kind of, stemmed from there like that's why I talk a lot about the people you keep around you because like you know uh, this industry can do that and people can be really hard on our youth and like you know it's like with social media or anything else like someone constantly telling you you're not enough or you're not this or that it's like I learned at a very my thoughts mimicked that for a long time you know yeah I mean and as human beings you know we're, we're just hard on each other um, you know, I, I, you know, we're hard and I can speak from experience, very hard on ourselves, but you mentioned kind of being bullied when you were younger. Um, I had experiences with that too, as did my, my twin brother. Um, but kids and just kind of seeing how kids treat each other, you know, through the lens of, of a parent, I'm like, man, 
kids are mean to each other. And then you realize that, you know, people are kind of mean to each other. Um, and then you get into, I got into the corporate world and I, you know, I, I had to get out, but, um, you know, I saw just how much backstabbing and just, just not niceness there really is just so other people could get ahead or feel, you know, falsely feel better about themselves. I imagine in an industry where looks are so essential, I mean, talent is like the cost of entry, but you know, looks are, or maybe it's not, maybe looks are the cost of entry. I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of on the far outside of that world, but um, you know, I imagine just the, the, the added pressure kind of like being in the spotlight or trying to be in the spotlight um, brings is, um, you know, for somebody who has a, um, you know, a kind of depression in the men or anxiety kind of inside them. It's, it's exacerbated almost. Yeah. It also, you know, it's really, I love that you mentioned that because what it sparked in my mind uh, instantly was this thing where for a lot of my life, I felt that the only value I had was my beauty that, you know, um, I was always the pretty one. I was the this, I was the that. I was never the smart one. I was never the one with the, the you know what I mean? And it just made me feel as if that was the only thing I had a value and it was the only thing people talked about. And I actually had a one woman show. I was writing all about this called The Cost and it's beauty is the only currency. And it was because I wanted to talk about how it's fleeting. You're you can never hold on to it. You're never this enough. You're never that enough. And you get older and then you're, the thing is to be younger and, and to try and hold on to that beauty. And it's just like, it's so isolating too. People think like, if you have it, everything's easy for you. And it's this and that. I'd almost argue it's the complete opposite because everyone hates you instantly, whether you're great or not, you know? And like, everyone thinks that they know everything about you. They have it all figured out. I'm like, I'm none of those things. I'm not any of the shit that you think. I'm a nerd. I'm super into space. I'm really into UFOs. I'm really into like, you name it. There's a million things about me that no one would ever anticipate. They see me and they're like, what the fuck do you know? And I'm, and then they hear my story and they're like, you know, I had this woman say once, like, as I started talking about some of my experiences and stuff, after sitting down and talking to her and her friend, she's like, holy shit. Like, I'm so glad that you, you know, are talking right now. And that, uh, because as soon as you sat down and you, you know, were saying something about your life, I was like, what the fuck does this pretty girl know about anything, any struggle, anything. And she's like, now you're talking. And I'm like, wow, what an asshole. I absolutely judged the situation. You know what I mean? And like that, that happens daily. And, and yeah, I couldn't agree more also with you about people being mean to each other. It's why I've tried to dedicate, I'm not perfect. But I really tried to be kind and warm and try and be that person that someone can turn to because it feels so lonely in this world yeah. sometimes and people aren't very nice to each other. And, you know, just social media is a small aspect of it, but like, you know, everyone wants these followers and this thing and they, because they want the, that and the, this, and what they don't realize is it's actually opening your life up to all kinds of negativity. I mean, I had so many people and I don't even have that many followers, like, like 80,000. So imagine the people with millions and millions and millions, but telling me constantly how ugly I am or how this I am and how that, and you're like, well, this is fun. <laughs> you know, it's like, why is that what we choose to do when we get on to this thing that's supposed to connect us all, you oh, know, it's like, you know, be careful for what you, what, what, you, what you wish for. Yeah. Um, but it's, 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 you know, you, you sparked a thought in me, like when, when we try to show the world, like who we think we are, right. We, we, and, and not who we're defined as by other people, like in my family of origin, and a lot of this shit goes back to family of origin stuff. And there's a line I have in a book that I wrote. And some people tell me that it's my most brilliant line. Anyway, it's very simple. Like it says, nobody can fuck you like family. Um, but it's like, I, I, you know, in my family of origin, I had to be the happy one, right? I had to be the happy one. Always had to have a happy face. I have a twin brother. He was always the angry one. And he had some health issues growing up. So he always, he got, always got a, kind of a little bit more leeway there to my mother. But if I ever like push back on her, I was just telling somebody this earlier this afternoon, if I ever had to push back on her and said, no, I, I won't do that for you today. Or if I was in a bad mood, like it was like the world was ending. It was like, I was, it was my fault for being in a bad mood, right? And like over time in my adult life, I realized that, hey, I can't express what I want in life and I can't show, you know, my my wife who I am because I'm I'm not supposed to be upset. I'm not supposed to be unhappy. I'm supposed to be happy go lucky. And once I realized that that was like an issue that I had to confront, like, like it was like kind of like an aha moment. 
but it's it's just so interesting to me and i hear other people talk about it too it's like when we show the world like you talk about being into space and kind of being a nerd and all that stuff um and people aren't willing to accept it because that's not how they want to perceive you as you know what i mean yeah absolutely i'll, I'll never forget like you know there was this moment and i don't know why what you just said sparked this but I had my first write up and it was going to be released in Fresno. And here's this town that like, I never felt like I belonged and I really wanted to. And, you know, I never, you know, all the things. And I got my first write up for cabin fever and it was coming out there and I was so fucking excited. And, um, and then I saw, and I posted it and then I saw other people repost it. And this one person's post was like, I hate when good things happen to shitty people. And I was like, what? Like instantly I was like, what, why me? What, 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 you know? And they were like, I just remember her being such a bitch in school. She just thought she was too good for everybody or whatever. And I was just like, holy shit, nobody knows me at all or my heart. And I'm like, instantly I'm like, what could I have done or what? And it's just, and I had this moment where I'm like, it doesn't matter what you did or how it was or what they did to reflect that reaction from you. People have their idea of what you are and you can't always, you can't really change people's opinion and you have to release that that's how they feel. But all I could do is try and be the most authentic version of myself and really try and show people who I am and hope that at the end of the day, the people that like it, like it. And the people that don't, don't. And like, that's what I've tried to really do with social media and with everything and every aspect of that. It's so fucking nerve wracking putting yourself out there. But I talk about my mental health. I talk about my dreams, my desires. And funny enough, social media has just become, and you know, someone said to me, it was like, that's a bit morbid, but I was like, I don't think so. Social media for me is just a way for me to leave messages to my son and to the people that I love. If anything ever happened to me, I post nothing but love notes to the people I love. It is literally novels and novels just being like, this is who I am. This is my heart. Because I, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be and it, this was later after my suicide attempt and many years of struggle that I was like, I'm not going to be what anyone wants me to be anymore. I'm not going to just be that hot, edgy chick. I'm not just going to be that. I'm going to be who I am. And I don't even know who I am. I'm a million different versions of those things. And I'm just going to try and show people who that is. And hopefully some people like it, you know? Well, you know, tell me about, about continue um, and, and why it was so important for you to, to make this film because you don't just star in it. I mean, you write direct, um, produce star um tap me, dance janitorial services well, no. I, I, left out, I left out tap dancing but we can <laughs> add that in there um yeah. tell me tell me about it yeah um so it's based on uh my story of living with depression and and you know with suicidal thought and suicide in my family and you know trauma running deep and I it was also my way of communicating so much of the pain I've watched my father endure and the deep conversations we've had about him talking about losing his father so in the film I didn't want it to be a grandfather I wanted it to be my father so that I could communicate firsthand all of these amazing lessons I've learned from being so close with my dad through a lot of this process but also my dad you know, without going into other people's trauma because I don't, or pain, I don't want to put his story out there, but he's battled depression most of his life too. And, and, you know, these same ideations that I have. And, you know, so it, it was, I wanted to communicate about it. And more so than anything, when I, the worst pain of it all was feeling so alone. And this is an aloneness I still feel all the time. You know, I don't know that it'll ever go away, but the difference is now I communicate about it and I reach out to people and I'm not embarrassed of it anymore. Um, you know, but that aloneness is unbearable, you know? And so I wanted to make a film that those people out there that felt the same way as me, that looked the same way as I did, that had the same struggles, like in the sense of look the same way. I mean, like know what it's like to feel like a fucking mess, you know, and know what it's like to be crying on the floor and not sure how you're going to get back up. And, you know, the worst part about it all is because you feel so isolated in that, you think you're the only one that is that way. And that is the worst part, that judgment on yourself, you know, a feeling like a burden, a feeling like a freak, you know, a feeling like something must be wrong with you because other people don't feel this and they don't talk about it and no one, you know, and like, so I wanted to change that and I wanted to make a movie that actually reflect, reflected what mental health 
looks like. I didn't want a polished, pretty version of it. And I didn't want, you know, I have some twists and turns and some big reveals. So I have to be always like careful about what I say about the film, but I didn't think that the people out there that felt like me would necessarily connect to another pretty girl who just got everything she wanted and got her happy story. And, you know, and I wanted to preach a very specific message of suicide prevention and you have to live and you have to give it another day. And I did that in a very specific way and through big reveals throughout the story. And, you know, I, my biggest mission and my biggest goal is that I can help. I can help just one person feel like they're not alone, you know, and to feel seen and to know they're not a freak that so many of us out there feel this way and, and have those moments, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, mental health is something that, um, you know, people don't talk about enough. Um, you, know, you look at you know, people who have, um, cancer, right? There's, there's all sorts of, and it's well known, like, you know, everyone knows somebody who suffered, who probably has had cancer at some point in their life. We think about mental health, there's, there's still such a taboo and a stigma to it. Um, you know, people being afraid to, to kind of talk about their mental health. And, and I know there's some gender differences there too, you know, men and women, and there's racial differences too. I mean, I was, I was talking to an Uber driver um, in Chicago a couple of years ago, it was pre-pandemic. And he was talking about, um, actually, no, it wasn't pre-pandemic. It was during the pandemic. Um, his son had um, been killed in a uh, Black Lives Matter riot in um, in uh, or in um, in Chicago, and um, he uh, he was telling me this, and he's like, you know, um, I said, well, how do you get over something like that? I'm like, you can't. He's like, well, I didn't talk to anybody about it for years, um, not for years, but as it happened, he's like, you know, people in my community you know, it's, it's seen as a sign of weakness to go to somebody else to air out. I think he even used an expression like to air your problems with somebody else. Like he's like, in our culture, we don't do that. And he's like, what I started to do is I started to talk to people in my Uber. Um, and, you know, he said that helped me. And he's like, you would, you'd be surprised at how many people, you know, he talked to would, would start expressing like some, someone they knew who, you know, some kind of trauma they had or some kind of, you know, and he's like, it, it wound up helping him. But there are the, these stigmas, you know, out there where people are just afraid to. And it's a scary thing. Look, I mean, I I, I see somebody um, and it's it's a scary thing to admit that you need help. Right. Because we're, we're all we're supposed to be wired the same way. And, you know, it, and, and there is that, you know, that that perceived stigma to it. And then you start going through it and you're like, wow, you know, hey, hey you feel better. I mean, most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes I don't feel better, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's out there. So, I mean, I, I love the, the message you're, you're communicating with this, with this piece of art. Well, and it, it, what you're saying couldn't be more accurate. Uh, like everything I only through making this movie, did I realize pretty much at every screening I've had for it so far, like in the very small amount of people I've been able to share it with almost every person in the audience or every person who watches it comes back and tells me their story and tells me the person they've lost or their own struggles. And there are so many people who have been affected by suicide. There are so many people affected by mental health and depression and all of that. And, and so many people who feel alone. And it's just like, until I made this film, I had no idea. And each day I have to remind myself of that. Like, you aren't alone. You aren't a freak. Like every time you show this movie, you get, I hold people weeping in my arms, telling me their story. And I'm just like, this is why I did it. And I'm so grateful that I did, but, but to speak to what you're saying, but there is still a fear for me. Like I'm a director. I have to be insured. Like I have multiple films, so, you know, so I, there is a fear when I'm on a podcast and I'm admitting that there is still struggles with suicidal ideation and there's still struggles with depression. I'm like, you know, that anxiety sets in, like, will they, will they judge me? Will they think that I can't do what I do because I have those thoughts sometimes or like that fear is all still so real and scary because there is this, you know, stigma and, and, you know, I had so many people tell me when I first started this mission that no one wants to talk about mental health. No one would ever make my film, which is why I invested my own money and I raised every dime myself and I ended up making it in a much smaller way. And as I've been trying to put it out into the world, 
it's very clear there are a lot of people that that do care about mental health, but the conversation isn't big enough yet. And we need more projects. We need more people talking about this. We need more people, you know, sharing their experiences because it's the only way we can all finally actually feel connected and realize how unrare this actually is because the numbers for suicide and depression and everything are skyrocketing skyrocketing, especially since the pandemic and during the pandemic. And it used to be just like, you know, the statistics were like middle-aged white men. Uh, and that's not the case anymore. It's our youth. Primarily it is from ages. I think they said 12 through 23 or 25 that are the he- biggest, uh, high, biggest demographic affected. Um, I just heard of a nine-year-old that took their life. That is sickening to me. Like that is so scary, you know, so scary to think that kiddos are having those thoughts this young. And it's just like, how as parents do we make sure that they're okay? How do we educate? And that is, I'm, you know, I'm developing my own nonprofit to come out with the film. And each day as I'm going through these experiences and I'm talking to the people around me, I'm realizing the people around me have no idea how to communicate about this shit. No one does it. No one has yet. This is all new. We need education. Like we need people talking about how to support people going through these experiences. You know, it's, I think it's a knowledge thing. And like the only way we can learn more is by talking about it more and having more people do it, you know? And having the right conversations too, because in, you know, in, in pop culture, I mean, you hear terms like oh, going to the nut house, you know, or that person's crazy. Um, you know, you, you, there, there's a lot of judgmental terms we use and just in our own vocabulary and, God knows I've been guilty of, of saying some insensitive things before. Um, but, you know, it's like we have to learn how to have the conversations, too. Um, you know, as parents, we have to spot it in our kids. I mean, we, we moved to um, I, I made the bright decision of uh, when, when our kids were in uh, seventh grade, moving to California. Um, so we moved to Agora Hills, beautiful town, beautiful area, idyllic life, pool, big house, all the mumbo jumbo. And, you know, one of my kids was not doing well at all. Um, yeah, and we pulled it pulled her away from her family, pulled her away from her friends. Um, so she was she was having issues and she was talking to us about, hey, I don't want to hurt myself, but I'm having visions of hurting myself. Um, so when we thankfully were kind of able to address that and, um, you know, and, and, and I don't think it was the move to California that was the root cause of of her anxiety and issues, but it did not help. Um, it kind of, kind of put them in overdrive a bit. We actually did wind up moving back to the Northeast six months later, um, for a number of other reasons. Um, but not the least, I mean, not, that was definitely on our mind. Coupled with that reason. Yeah, I knew it was reason. definitely on our mind. Yeah. That, yeah. that was, it, they, put it this way. It did not hurt the cause to move back for, for, for her to go through that. Um, and, um, but, you know, we have to, as parents, we have to learn to recognize it in our kids and not, and, and listen to them and not blow them off, um, which is kind of a different style of parenting than certainly my parents were, were part of where they didn't see us all day long. And, and maybe we talk about something over the dinner table, maybe. So. Yeah, absolutely. I can, I can definitely relate to that, that I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't say my family talked about these things whatsoever. And I will say that some of the ways that they did talk about it is some of the stuff that's deep seated in my brain of like, you're too emotional. You're too this, you're, you know, you're intense. You're, you know, all those words that once again, made me feel like a freak, you know, made me feel like a weirdo and like different things. But the truth is, is like people just all process in a different way and experience in a different way, you know, and, and it's beautiful that, your daughter could come to you and have that conversation. It just speaks to who you guys are as parents, because I know that when I was doing that and harming myself and doing that, I didn't necessarily feel like I had that safe place to go, you know, so that it's really beautiful and really beautiful that she came to you, you know, and yeah, it's, it's, I, it's, I'm really leaning towards needing to find a way to educate the people to create a curriculum with doctors and with people of how to actually respond to your kids or your friends or your sister or your daughter. Um, 
who is going through these experiences and what vocabulary we can use and which way that we can stay open and not make them feel judged, you know? And I, because the worst part is, is you might be saying everything perfectly in your brain, but they're already feeling, they already are judging themselves so much, so much inside and internally that like one comment you say, they can, you know, it can spin and it can, I, I think that all the time I'm like, okay, process. I heard what you, I heard how that, what they said, what you thought it meant, but let's actually analyze what it actually was said, you know, and like, what could they have meant or what did they mean? Or, you know, but when you're young, you don't necessarily have the means and, or to do all of that. You know, luckily I have a therapist that I work with heavily on all of these things. (laughs) You mentioned the curriculum. I remember kind of being in in high school um, and, and middle school also where again, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you. Um, so we were in the sort of the Nancy Reagan, um, just say no kind of years of, um, for drugs. And, um, uh, I remember we'd have these assemblies about just say no, and we'd have assemblies about not doing drugs and how harmful drugs are. And I'm thinking, you know what, a lot of the reasons why people do drugs, um, aside from the fact that they they can get them is they're medicating. They're trying to do something to make themselves feel normal. Um, and, and people who wind up having a real, you know, hard time with, it. I mean, I know there's chemical dependencies, but, um, they become such an effective, it's funny. There, there was something called dare out here. I'm sure it was natural uh, national, but the D A R E and it was, um, uh, I drugs. Can't drugs avoidance, resistance, education. And my I friends still and I, have like five shirts of it. I have like vintage tees that I wear all the time. So yeah. <laughs> but my friends would say, no, it stands for drugs are really efficient or drugs are really effective. Um, <laughs> kind of joking like idiots, but but that's a lot of the reason why people you know, turn to these things and 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 they rely on them. I mean, I know I used to zone out and 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 drink a bottle of wine on the couch when I was feeling lonely. Um, you know, just wanting to kind of just zone out of, you know, the the pain and loneliness I was feeling in my own life. Um, which was not healthy. Um, that's well, something I, I realized, but. Um, well, I was definitely going to say, I am those people you were talking about. So yeah. I can really relate to that. Yeah, I I used to call myself a chemist or that's what I how I refer to it now. It's like how many drinks to make you forget your problems and to feel great. And when is one too many that unleashes it all actually and makes you lost in your despair, you know, using a yeah. depressant to not be depressed and using drugs and all of those things and like having the come down and all of, yeah, it never, it never helped. And that's why sobriety has definitely been part, a big part of my journey and all of that. But yeah, it's, it, it is, it was absolutely to numb. It was to try and not feel such immense things inside, you know? But if we, if we start off, you know, with, with kids talking about, Hey, you know, we're not all wired the same way. And if you are having these feelings, um, just kind of addressing it, acknowledging it, you know, being loving um, towards them, um, you know, maybe that's the key to, you know, the, what the D.A.R.E. program was trying to do, you know, maybe, maybe, or there's, I don't know, in my mind, there's something there, you know, you mentioned curriculum and I'm like, no one ever talked to us about mental health. Yeah. You know, they talked to us, they talked to the shit of, to us about drugs. Um, and alcohol and all that stuff, but no one ever talked about mental health. And, you know, it, it's still one of those things like it's still taboo. Yeah. And it, and it makes you wonder like, okay, but please, Lord Jesus, tell me we are now, like, tell me the schools are now because it's like, yeah, we didn't have that then. And yes, dare programs and all of those things existed, but haven't we learned enough now to understand that the substance abuse problems are half the time connected to mental health? And like, is, is it in schools? Do they have, uh, you know, therapists available for these kids who are experiencing these things? How can we fix it? You know, this is like, one of the things I question all the time. And, you know, I had a really beautiful conversation with a friend the other day that was like, as a parent, what can we do? What, how can we do better than our parents did? You know? And, and it's funny, your line about family. I always say, if you can fuck your kids up a little bit less than your parents fucked you up, then you're winning as a parent. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's all you can do. Hope that you do a little less damage than the ones that came before you, you know? And like, yes, I know that I'll mess up along the way, but like, how can I how can I make sure I don't mess up on this thing? How can I make sure that he feels supported? And, you know, not many people know, but I have this book. I didn't, I'm not good on baby books. I'm really bad. I'm like really good bad at filling them out and doing those things. Just like, 
Um, but instead I started a journal when my son was an infant and I've been writing him letters along the way just to tell him like some of our journey and struggles and beautiful days and where we're working and what's happening. And, um, you know, and I've actually started to use that journal to him to start to communicate about these things, you know, like, you know, just so you know that there's days where I'm sad and there's things and it has nothing to do with you. It's just those days kind of happen and it's really normal. And, you know, trying to find the line of like, how much do you tell them that's healthy and how much do you, you know, like there's that fine line also where, you know, you don't want your problems can't become your kids' problems, you know, like you don't want to air too much, but how do you communicate enough that they can understand that it's normal to feel that way, you know? Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have. The highs and lows. So what's what's next for continue? What's what's the next step of the process? So it's it's done, edited, uh, in the can, as they say, or yes, it is, and it's um set to come out uh, in 2022 um, in the festival circuit, if that's how it all ends up panning out. And um, yeah, so continue is finished and I'm just trying to get that baby out into the world and, you know, share it with people. And, you know, the next films are, I'm casting on my next projects now and feel really damn blessed to be able to be working on my next films and yeah so yeah really Jeez, i mean especially like th this time i mean this time this year is a lot different than this time last year in terms of how how that's going i'm sure with uh with vaccinations and sort of um I, every time i think covid's going to be in the rear view it's there's something new pops up um but how, how is it working in the in the in the film and movie industry right now uh with with covid i mean for a while there it was like scary and painful and competitive and just felt like complete uncharted territory. Things are feeling a lot more normal now because things are going back into production and people can't just not make movies anymore. And so they're doing it, but, you know, I'm seeing with a lot of my friends and being able to be connected with some really talented, amazing producers and humans, I'm getting to also hear their journeys and like one of you know, a production just got shut down for three weeks because I got COVID and cost, you know, a million dollars extra. And you're just like, holy shit, this is terrifying, you know, about to be entering into that world. And yeah, I can, I can relate more to, I feel like every moment it feels like, okay, this is, we're going to be okay. Things are going back to normal. And then you hear about some new variant that makes you terrified, you know, and you're like, oh my God, are we going all back into our houses? Please tell me we're not going back into our houses again, you know? And it's just like, there is this terror of like, shit, I thought, I thought I saw, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel and, and, you know, so yeah, it's weird. It's weird times. And every time it feels like it's moving and yeah. we're like on the train and we're going and then something pops up. I mean, that's like my husband just was telling me, a, you know, a couple of days ago about this new variant and like, they're hoping it doesn't jump over. And immediately I'm like, yo, I have numerous projects that are casting at this moment that are ready to go we're like and i'm like what does this mean like i already when i finally made my baby that took me 10 years to create the week that literally we ended editing that week because we heard about the possibility of a pandemic and da 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 and edit on that monday by that thursday i think or whatever day it was pandemic was everything was shut down my husband lost his job our whole, we're like, what is happening? You know? And so I'm like, okay, film number two is going to be easier. Film number two is good. And, and then you're like, oh, just kidding. Cool. Like, you know, it's just this weird dance of having no idea what tomorrow is going to bring, but I guess life is that way. And, you know, it's no different for everybody. I'm sure yeah. they all, everyone feels that way, especially right now, you know? <laughs> So was there anything, um, and I just have to ask, you know, back in, in March of 2020, right. Was there anything that got you through the pandemic entertainment wise? Did you, did you get sucked into any of the, uh, Tiger King stuff or anything like that? Um, I don't, I, if I'm honest, I really threw myself into physical activity during all of that because yeah. of my mental health. And I was also on a, a rewrite job. So I was working every single day from home with my little guy who's home full time and, you know, the hubby who had just lost his job and his home full time. So I feel like I didn't get to 
binge things in the same way that I would have loved to. That being said, I'm sure I watched so many good things that I'm not recalling right now. I mean, I, I feel like I just discovered so many beautiful little indies along the way and so yeah. many good television shows. I mean, Amazon and, and Hulu and, you know, Netflix as well. Like they just are coming out with incredible content, you know, and there was like the show, the dark that I watched during that time. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like a foreign show on Netflix. It is unbelievable. Um, normal people on Hulu, like there's just so many films that just like, and shows that moved me. Um, and I can't remember if it was during the pandemic or a little after, but all through there, I will say there's just been incredible content. And then, you know, one of the saddest things too, is I think that so many films just got released during that pandemic. So I feel like so many went under the radar that shouldn't have, you know? And so it was nice to discover these little films that I, not that I actually know that they're little, maybe they did a ton of things. Who knows? I was in a pandemic. I don't know if anyone else watched it, but you know, like there was this film Little Fish. Um, and I, I always try and tell people about it because it was just impeccably done and it was such an incredible film and so inspiring. And, you know, that's one of the ones that stood out to me that um, I discovered, you know, around the pandemic um, that kind of just popped up and I hadn't heard about it. You know, it, I think it had been at festivals and then got bought and released during the pandemic and all of that. So there was like lots of cool little discoveries like that. Yeah. Yeah. So a guy I'm asking is a friend of mine asked me if I was planning on watching the, the, the new season of Tiger King, I guess they're doing it. They did a second season. I'm like, I can't do it. Cause <laughs> it, it's going to remind me of just where I was, you know, mentally, emotionally and in March and April of 2020. And I'm like, I don't need that reminder. Anymore. Yeah. You're like, I'm not going back. <laughs> I will not. I will not go back to that. Even that place in my mind. I'm like, Ugh, no, can't do it. I, I'm sure it's fine. I, I hope the people who worked on it, um, you know, uh, reap some good okay. rewards. But, yeah, exactly. I hope you killed it. I just can't go back there. <laughs> well, won't do it. Well, this has been fun, Nadine. I, I I appreciate the time you spent, you know, chatting with me about your your life, your career, about Continue, of course. Um, where can people go to learn more about Continue? Um, continuethefilm.com is uh, our website. We have the trailer on there as well as on YouTube, um, you know, on my social media. I have We have Continue the Film and my production company and my personal. I'm always posting about Continue um, and behind the scenes photos and different things like that um, as I'm out there in the world trying to get it out into the world to you, everybody. Um, but yeah, there's always information uh, via social media and our website. We try and keep it updated. Well, throw out your social so people can know where to go to follow you. Yes. Yay. All right. Well, Nidhi, thank you very much. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having me.